Hey, <clears throat> uh, Alex again here. We're on Chapter 9, Receivables. So on these ones, our receivables are very important. I'm going to go over the intro. This is a really good intro. And then we'll just move on to the important, the meat. So the sale and purchase of merchandise involves the exchange of goods for cash. However, the point at which cash actually changes hands varies with the transaction. Consider transaction transactions by Oakley Incorporated, a worldwide leader in design, development, manufacture, and distribution of premium sunglasses, goggles, prescription eyewear, apparel, footwear, and accessories. Not only does the company sell its products through three different company-owned retail chains, but it also has approximately 10,000 independent distributors. If you were to buy a pair of sunglasses at Oakley Vault, which is one of the company's retail outlet stores, you would have to pay cash or use a credit card to pay the glasses before you left the store. However, Oakley allows its distributors to pay to purchase sunglasses on account. These on account are, uh, transactions are recorded as receivables due from the distributors. As an individual, you might build up a trusted financial history with a local company or department store that would allow you to purchase merchandise on account. Like o Oakley's distributors, your purchase on account would be recorded as an account receivable. Such credit transactions facilitate, facilitate sales and are significant current assets for many businesses. This chapter describes common classifications of receivables, illustrates how to account for undercollectible receivables, and demonstrates the reporting of receivables on the balance sheet. Okay, so the term receivables includes all money claims against other entities, including people, companies, and other organizations. So it just means you have a a rightful claim to money from that particular person, entity, whatnot. Accounts receivable normally collected within a short period, such as 30 or 60 days. They are classified on the balance sheet as a current asset. So they have a, um, they're, if you're going to collect them within 30 days, it's a current asset, which is normally the time you pay it off. Uh, notes receivable are amounts that customers owe for which a formal written instrument of credit has been issued. So if someone wants longer than 30 days, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to credit their accounts receivable, <coughs> and you're going to debit notes receivable. And what's going to happen is by doing that, by debiting accounts uh, notes receivable, crediting accounts receivable, you can move them from a 30-day to a 60-day time limit. And normally you'll have interest. So you might tack on 10% interest because you're given a longer to pay it. And so normally you'll do this, you'll have to sign a note because it's a lot more formal and it's a lot stronger claim. Um, other receivables, there's also um, other types of receivables. So other receivables include interest receivable, taxes receivable, and receivables from officers or employees. So employees might owe you. They might have done something, purchased something on account, and they'll pay you back later. Um, anything over a year, so if you're going to collect anything over a year, it's a um, non-current asset. Anything over a year that you're going to collect is a non-current asset. And normally it can go under the caption investments. So normally it's an investment if it's longer than a year. Uh, Okay, regardless of how careful a company is in granting credit, some credit sales will be uncollectible. The operating expense recorded from uncollectible receivables is called bad debt expense. So bad debt is, um, is what you do when you want to get rid of a receivable that you're not going to collect on. The rules usually are if it's, if it's past due, they don't respond to your... Uh, collect your attempt to collect, they file for bankruptcy, the business goes under, they close the business, 
and the company if you can't locate the customer or whatnot. So that's when you write it off. Now there's two ways to do this. This is the meat of the chapter. The direct write-off method records bad debt expense only when an account is determined to be worthless, or the allowance method records bad debt expense by estimating uncollectibles accounts at the end of the accounting period. So um, direct write-off is going to be used by small businesses, small companies, because they're going to have a lot less accounts to deal with. But the allowance method will be used by larger companies that have more accounts, and they can just kind of do most, more of an estimation. It's more accurate. Okay, so let's say we had to write off uh, $3,000, um, a receivable from uh, John Booth. And so we're going to debit bad debt expense for 3000 and we're going to credit accounts receivable John Booth for 3000 because we've moved his account and we've, we've expensed it because we're not going to collect it. Okay, and then next we have a account receivable if, if for some reason he comes back, if he comes back and he can pay, then we're going to reinstate his account first. Before we take his money, we're going to put him back in the books as we're going to debit accounts receivable 3000 We're going to credit bad debt expense for 3000 So now we're going to take it back out of the bad debt, move it into the receivable again, and have it be owed. And then we're going to credit the accounts receivable after we put it back on and debit cash for the 3000 Because now, after we put it back on the books, now we can collect. Um, So that's, uh, that was the direct write-off. Um, now the allowance, if you're using the allowance method, you don't you use, you use bad debt still, but you're going to do, you're going to debit bad debt expense for 30, uh, for 20,000 for the, for the whole amount of the year that you think you're not going to get. So you'll debit it for 20,000. You're going to credit allowance for doubtful accounts. Now this is a contra asset. This account is going to lower your accounts receivable on the balance sheet. So it's a contra asset. Um, and, uh, and the difference between your accounts receivable minus your allowance is your net realizable value for the accounts receivable. So it's going to go hand in hand. So you debit bad debt expense for 20000 you credit allowance for that for accounts for 20000 you've filled the bucket. You have a resource you can pull from. Now, when you find out someone can't pay you, so let's say um, Frida Smith that can't pay her uh, $5,000 bill, so now you're going to debit the allowance for that full accounts for $5,000, and you're going to credit accounts receivable Frida Johnson for $5,000. So now you're going to you're throwing you're writing off her receivable against the allowance that you made earlier in the period, so you don't always have to keep expensing things. You can already you can already you can forecast how much you're going to expense. Allowance method, dump it in. Yep, it's like dump it in the bucket. Okay, there's two ways to do this met, uh, allowance method. You can do it by percent of percent of sales method, or you can do it by analysis of receivables method. The allowance, the percent. Okay, the percent of sales method is you take your total sales. So let's say we have um, three thousand. We have three million sales. We're going to times it by what we think we're not going to get. So here is uh, three fourths percent times three fourths percent equals twenty two thousand five hundred. We're not going to get. So now we debit bad debt expense for twenty two thousand five hundred. And we credit allowance for doubt for accounts for 22500 So you can see we just take our net sale, our total sales, times the, per the uh, percent we think we're not going to get. And we're going to just put the entry in for that amount. Debit bad debt, expense, credit allowance for doubt for accounts. But if we do it by the receivables method, analysis of receivables, what we're going to do is we're going to find out after doing an aging schedule, an aging schedule is where you just put each account 
in order by how old it is, how long it's been since it's been there. And the longer it's been there, the higher percent you're not going to get. And so what you'll do is you'll find how many by, per, by analysis of receivables to see how much you will get. And then you'll figure out, okay, so you'll take, you'll, you'll times your receivables by your percent you figured out that you analyzed, that you won't get. <clears throat> and then you're going to, instead of just throwing that all into the allowance, you're going to find out what the ending for allowance is. And if the, what, if the percent, if the amount you got is um, under what it is now, so if your allowance for doubt, doubtful accounts is bigger than your estimate, you're going to bring down the allowance back to your estimate. Or if your estimate's larger, you're going to bring up. Uh, you're going to bring up your amount to the uh, to what you have. <clears throat> so let me see here. Yeah, so here. Here they have the, they had an estimate of twenty six thousand four hundred and ninety, but the adjusted but the um but their but their balance is only twenty three thousand two hundred forty, so they have to bring up that account. So all you're gonna do is if your estimate was twenty six thousand four hundred and ninety, but your balance and your um allowance for doubtful accounts is twenty three thousand twenty three thousand two hundred and forty, you're gonna do one entry of three thousand two hundred and twenty five. And you're, so you're going to debit bad debt, debt for 2325 credit allowance because you're only going to you're not going to just add them all together and make a new estimate you're going to find out you're not going to just throw it in like a sales method you just throw in the percent you figure out but on this method you don't do that you just find out the ending balance and you throw it into that so it's a smaller entry I'll show you, you know what, on these ones, I'll show you an example on those ones. That'll be my example for the chap for that chapter. It's just that that method. Just to compare them. Okay, so um, so bad debt, so direct write-off is all bad debt. Everything's written off to bad debt. Under allowance, everything's written off to allowance without for accounts. Remember that. Okay, notes receivable have interest rates. The maturity value is the amount paid at the due date of the note, which is the sum of the face amount and the interest. So what you have is if you have a $2,000 note at 10% for 90 days, you're going to do 2,000 times 10% times 90 over 360 will give you $50 interest. So when you do a note, you take, if someone wants a note, you credit accounts receivable for the 6,000 or whatnot. Debit notes receivable for the six thousand, and now when they when they pay you off their account, after you've made it into a note receivable, you're going to debit cash for six thousand and sixty. You're going to credit note receivable for six thousand, and you're going to credit interest receivable for sixty. So when they pay you, they're going to pay you a little bit more than what their note was for the for the time. Um, now, if for some reason they dishonor the note, if the maker of the note fails to pay the note on the due date, the note is a dishonored note receivable. What this means is you're going to debit accounts receivable 6060 You're going to credit notes receivable for 6000 And you're going to credit interest revenue for 60 And what this is going to do is you're going to... Um, you're 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 throwing it back from the note into an account because they've already just dishonored the note. The note's no good. Put them into an account. Add in the interest they owe you, and then when they go to pay you, you'll just pay. You'll just take it out of the receivable. All right. Uh, accounts receivable turnover measures how frequently during the year the accounts receivable are be, being converted to cash. So accounts receivable turnover equals net sales divided by average accounts receivable. So for here they had net sales of 35,497. They divided it by an average of 4,403 accounts receivable equals an 8.1 ratio. Which means for every dollar of a receivable, they made $8 in sales. 
You see? You can see how quickly you're, and the higher that number, the better. So it's good to keep that ratio high. Uh, the number of days in receivables is an estimate of the length of time the accounts receivable has been outstanding. So number of days in receivables equals average accounts receivable divided by average daily sales. So um, average daily sales is determined by dividing net sales by 365 days. And so by doing that, you'll be able to find a ratio of like here, they had 97.3 because they divided their 3,497 sales by 369, 365. And what that gives you is, so every day they made $93.30. If they stretched their sales out and broke it down by day, how much would their, see how you can, Really good amount. That's a really good. These and these um. These ratios are sometimes going gone over quickly. Like in accounting classes, you might just breeze over ratios. But ratios are what you're going to use to really see how you've progressed. The the your either the business, uh, your personal finances. You can see what your trend is. If you've if you're increasing a ratio. If it's maintaining around a similar time. So that was chapter nine. Uh, I'll go. I'll do. This is a good problem. This is a good chapter to do an example on. Um, but yeah, so remember that I'll have to show you the percentage of sales method and the analysis of receivables method because that's not always the most clear. On. Um, uh, I just want to make sure you guys are getting it. Um, okay, we got that. Yeah. So I guess I'll see you on the next video. Thank you. If you have any comments, ask. You can even put a whole problem down there. Maybe we can do it uh, or whatnot. So thank you. I'll see you for either an, an example or 10, chapter 10. Have a good day.